Hey there, my name is Leanne Bogle and I'm the host of the Keto Diet Podcast. I'm also the best-selling author of The Keto Diet, The Keto Diet Cookbook, and Keto for Women. I'm so excited to see you here for episode 332 of the podcast. Wow, today I'm interviewing my dear friend, Jennifer Fugo. Her and I go way, way, way back from before we were married, before we were bloggers. Um, so much has changed in her business and what I love about today's conversation is she is dropping the knowledge bombs for us. If you deal with any sort of skin issue, we're talking about it. We're talking about the root causes, why coconut oil isn't the best thing to put on your skin, and so, so much more. If you have questions about today's content, go ahead and post them down below in the comments here on YouTube or you can contact me with the links down below. If you wanna reach our guest Jennifer for any reason to work with her or check out her website, I will include all those links down below in the show notes, right down there. So I have two things that I need to share with you and those are the two sponsors of today's show. The first is Keto Bars. They make a delicious alternative to eating, I don't know, Mars bars, Snickers instead on your ketogenic diet a perfect balance of sweetness, but like not too sweet because some of those bars are so. And then last but certainly not least, our friends over at Find My Formula, they make nootropics that are customized to you. If you're having issues with brain function and you just can't get things going, click down below. You'll be thankful you did. Okay, let's get to today's interview. Hello, Jennifer, how are you? I am well. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like this has been a long time in the making and I'm so excited to be here. My goodness. I think you're one of my oldest pals on the internet. Like we started talking before blogging was even popular. Yes. Back when Healthful Pursuit was, oh my goodness. Vegan. Some, yes. You vegan. were doing gluten-free school. <laughs> Like, look at us Lots. now. Lots of change. We've grown up. <laughs> yeah, totally. Got married. Like, I know. come on. <laughs> Lots has happened. Um, so tell me how you got into skin. I'm just going to ask straight up, like, <laughs> why skin? Because this is a very different topic. And when I saw you were doing this, I mean, you're brilliant in this space. And I started seeing more and more people sharing your stuff. I'm like, I got to get Jennifer on the show because so many people deal with this, but like, how did you get, how did you get into it? Basically I ended up with eczema on my hands back in 2014. I was in the middle of grad school and I started getting these weird bubbles. And for anybody who's had this experience, a lot of times they don't even know what it's called, but it's called dyshidratic eczema, where you get these clear bubbles under your skin. It happens to the palms of your hands and the, yes, palms of your hands and the, the, the soles of your feet. I was like, wait a minute, did I say that right? And um, you get these like little clear bubbles that eventually get super itchy and then they burst and then your skin gets super inflamed and it feels like it's burning and on fire and you're itchy and it's painful and then it calms down and it cracks and heals over and then it starts again and it's this like awful very hellish cycle of having very calm skin to then only like end up in this situation where like you can't touch anything i couldn't even wash my hands when um like in the summertime so i live where it's we have four seasons so in the summertime my skin would get so reactive that even just water was like someone was pouring acid on my hands. Um, and in the winter time, my skin would dry out so much that obviously, you know, we use our hands for a lot of different things. And every time I would bend, I would get all these paper cuts. So it was incredibly painful and torturous to the point where like, I was afraid to touch anything. I couldn't wash my hand or wash my hair because gloves don't keep water out. I couldn't go to the gym anymore because I couldn't wash my hands. Um, I just like got to the point where I was wearing blue gloves all the time to avoid washing my hands, but then like dealing with this whole situation. And so I really saw firsthand just how much suffering actually goes into people who have chronic skin issues. Like it's not just like painful and itchy. 
I, I think a lot of people just like, oh, you don't know how to moisturize your hands. You're not washing with the right soap, change your laundry detergent. Like I did all of that. And in fact, I was already using the clean stuff, the good stuff that doesn't have all the junk and chemicals and whatnot in it. And none of that helped. I was already gluten-free and egg-free and dairy-free for six years. So it wasn't like all of a sudden I had this like whole slew of new food issues. It was something going on under the surface. And so honestly, at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. I put something, cobbled something together over time when I finally gave up and I was able to get my skin to stop um, with this, with this awful cycle. And it took a lot of time. It took like a year to get my skin to stop. And when I sort of walked out of that and I was so happy for myself, I was still in Facebook groups and I realized I want to help share what I've learned, my experience with these people who are still suffering like children. When I see children like the pictures of babies covered in rashes crying. Like I can imagine the parents are so upset because they don't know how to help their, their, their kids. Um, and I I'm grateful for my colleague. Uh, her name's also Jennifer, Jennifer brand. She actually works with kids. I don't, I only work with adults, but like to help adults too, who are really suffering and struggling. And so I just didn't want to leave people behind. I felt like it was, I don't, I don't want to say that my suffering served as a purpose because I think sometimes people, I, I, I know when I was in the middle of it, I don't want to hear that there was some like greater meaning to all of that. But to be honest with you, I turned my own suffering into something that I could really help others with. And um, I feel really blessed that oddly, I feel blessed that I had that experience because now I actually know what it feels like. Wow. I couldn't even imagine the struggle that that would have been like to have to wear gloves and worry about washing your hands. I mean, these are basic things that we do without thinking. What other kind of skin issues are there? You talked about babies covered in rashes, this eczema thing, or I'm Canadian. So we say eczema, <laughs> yes. eczema, 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 yeah. eczema, eczema thing. Like what other issues of the skin can there be? Is that like too large of a question to ask? (laughs) No, no. So in my practice, I mostly focus on eczema or eczema, uh, psoriasis, rosacea, dandruff. Um, I do work with some cases of tinea versicolor, which is like a fungal skin infection that is more predominant in areas where it's like super humid or tropical. Um, And I've also worked on some cases of lichen sclerosis. And there's some other oddballs in there, I'm sure, but those are like the main focuses of what I do. So it's like the most common chronic skin issues. There's a little bit of acne, but most of the time that's never the primary concern because acne is like a completely different beast because there's so many different hormonal components and whatnot to it. So for me, it's really looking at these chronic rashes that can be triggered by a number of different reasons that may or may not necessarily be acknowledged at this point in time by conventional dermatology. And I'm not saying this to say I know better than doctors or that doctors don't have a role here. I want to be very clear. My dad was in a medical doctor and a surgeon, so I have great respect for doctors, but I do think that they're, that they're always like five to 10 years behind. And I, I hate to say this, but like that's five to 10 years of somebody's life. They're never getting back. That's five to 10 years of missing. Like your kids grow up because you can't go out. Like I work with some people who are so sick. They can't work. They can't pick up their kids that, you know, I work with some folks who have staph infections head to toe and can't hug their spouse. They can't hug their children because it's contagious. So you lose out on quality of life. And I just, I want to help provide people with other avenues to start looking in other directions when they've exhausted the change your skincare, take a topical steroid, you know, maybe cut out eggs, um, or they're just fed up or not interested in doing an elimination diet, because I don't think, well, you can ask me my feelings on elimination diet if you are so, so interested, but, um, I just want to give people different options and other options that they probably haven't heard of before. 
Yeah. And that was going to be my next question because you mentioned a little bit, like I cleaned up the, you know, I was doing all the natural stuff. I wasn't doing the soaps. I wasn't having eggs. I wasn't having gluten. Those are kind of the basic. I mean, even if you go to a dermatologist, I would imagine that they're just topicals and things like that. Take this pill, see if it gets better. If you go to a nutritionist, they'll probably say do an elimination diet, you know, um, remove eggs, remove grains, uh, check your soaps. What's at the, what's the hidden root of, of these things? Cause I feel like maybe that will help. Maybe it won't, but what's at the root of, yeah. of these issues? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I will say this, it is sometimes food, but most of the time when it's a food driven issue, it's a food allergy, like an actual true food allergy. Now it's not to say that we can't be reactive to food. There are some people who actually have found their skin gets better on, for example, a carnivore diet. There's other people who found their skin gets better on a vegan diet. And you could go well, like, why would that make any sense? They're two very polar opposite diets. They're both elimination diets as well. And my question is always, okay, fine. Your skin may have improved because you changed your diet, but why? And that's really the bigger question. So if we don't have true food allergies, then why is it possible that maybe, maybe a diet change might work? And the reason is that there are other hidden root causes that drive this inflammatory process. Like, how do I know that this is an inflammatory process aside from it's like kind of like most modern disease is and chronic disease is driven by inflammation. But we know that because the biologic drugs that are huge blockbusters like Dupixent for eczema, Humira and Embrel for psoriasis, for example, they all they do is block inflammation pathways. That's how they get your, your rashes to go away is to block an inflammatory pathway. So then you have to say, well, like, what's actually driving that in the first place? Like, could I not necessarily shut the pathway off? Cause to me, I'm sort of like, that's like check, shutting off your check engine light, but what's actually causing that pathway to be on overdrive. And so I've talked about this on the healthy skin show where it's like, there are 16 root causes to, at least that's what I found so far to cause people's skin to go nuts. You also don't have to have any gut symptoms to have some of these, including gut problems that are pretty um, common with skin issues. So I'll just run through them really quick. If you wanna dive deeper into any of them, I'm happy to, but basically there's microbiome dysbiosis that can be on the skin as well as in the gut. You can have gut dysfunction. There can be diet and food reactions. And again, that would include food, actual food allergies liver detox challenges. So it does not mean by the way that you should do a liver detox or a liver cleanse, um, but that there are actual challenges that pro prohibit or prevent your liver from actually functioning in a biochemical um, manner that it's supposed to. Uh, nutritional deficiencies, trauma, unmanaged stress. There can be genetic implications as well. Things like filagrin, for example. Um, thyroid dysfunction is a big problem. There's also other hormonal imbalances like estrogen dominance to consider, autoimmunity, drug reactions, mitochondrial dysfunction, heavy metal exposure, environmental toxins, and then environmental allergies. Because for some of my folks who have a lot of allergies, I work with people who are like allergic to every tree, every weed and whatnot, um, that can also be a factor as well. Okay. We need to talk about the liver piece because I know that somebody heard that and they're like, I'm just going to grab some milk thistle and see what happens. Um, thoughts on the liver and really it's role because the liver seems to be quite popular nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. so what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are that we're so focused. We're like a detox obsessed society. And we don't realize that the liver in and of itself has this amazing capacity. There is incredible brilliance in our body. It is brilliant. You know, it wants to survive. It wants to thrive. And the liver is just the same. It's basically like a repackaging process. <laughs> that is what liver detoxification does. So we do not need to constantly detoxify our liver. Like 
I don't know who is saying this. And I know there's a lot of people saying this on the internet, but that's actually not true. Your liver has different phases to detoxification. There's phase one that's predominantly genetic, genetically driven. Um, so SNPs can impact that, but phase two detox is what I'm specifically talking about. And that is nutri nutrient driven. So you have different pathways like the glutathione pathway, the glycine pathway. And what I found from my, literally my own clinical experience. So I don't know this from reading a book or anything. It wasn't something that was taught to me. It was through seeing patterns over and over and over again, that when people had skin issues and they had, they also unfortunately tend to have some sort of dysbiosis under the surface, the toxins produced by what's living in the GI tract end up in your liver. It has to get converted to a substance called, so from benzoates to hippurates, and that requires glycine to make that conversion. We don't make glycine. You have to have a constant supply and not what your body just needs for any given day. It means you need an additional amount. And so when I say liver detox challenges, I'm specifically talking most of the time about nutrient depletions that cause the liver to slow down and it can no longer keep up with what it needs to do in order to keep you healthy. So you end up with this like backlog of toxins and waste products that your liver just cannot deal with. We love to think that our body makes all of the things that it needs to thrive, but it does not. And so when you have this issue where you've like drastically changed your diet, drastically removed things, maybe you've done such a drastic change, like you went vegan or you went carnivore and all of a sudden, like the nutrient profile is really drastically different. Or you did this like really crazy elimination diet where you took out I don't even know, you're down to like 10 foods a day. Unfortunately, you can put yourself, believe it or not, at risk for other nutrient depletions. Um, and so that's where it's really crucial to double check that what you are consuming is actually getting in and that there aren't other areas that might actually need to be supplemented or supported. So that's why when I say liver detox, it's not about doing a detox, not about buying milk thistle. And by the way, friends, if you have a ragweed allergy, you should not buy milk thistle because that is in the ragweed family and that will make things worse. So, um, I don't, I actually don't know a single person who's gotten better using milk thistle glycine the amino acid is actually much more helpful in supporting liver detox than milk thistle is in my personal opinion. Brilliant. And one other thing that you said was the gut skin connection. You mentioned uh, the microbiome, not only in our gut, but also on our skin. Could you elaborate mm -hmm. on that too? Yes. So there are, as many of us know, there is a, an incredible ecosystem that lives within the body. And we have many different microbiomes. There's a microbiome in your eye and your bladder. I mean, we've got them everywhere, but I consider what's going on in the gut to be sort of command central. And when there's a problem in command central, we're going to see that extend outward to some of these other microbiomes. And so a lot of times when people have difficulty maintaining a healthy skin microbiome, and so leaky skin, the concept of leaky skin. I did not coin that term, by the way, the first time I saw it written about was actually on Dr. Sarah Ballantyne's website, Paleo Mom. And so what that is, is where your skin barrier becomes extremely compromised, similar to leaky gut, except you know, your skin is really, really, really on the outside of the body. And so unfortunately, yes, you can become sensitized when your skin gets messed up to allergens and all sorts of things that you apply to your skin. So it's another reason why you got to be careful what you actually put on your skin um, when you have rashes, because it's even worse when your barrier is compromised, but the microbiome can get shifted to a point where staph aureus, for example, can take over, which can be a huge, huge problem because that is actually like, if you get a staph infection, that's a, an infection that, as I was saying before, you can pass to other people. And if it gets really, really, really bad, you can end up on IV antibiotics and like, it's very seriously painful. It is like, that is even another extremely hellish situation. That's even worse than just having rashes, unfortunately. Um, and so 
what I have found a lot of times, and it's fascinating because it's not, there's not some cookie cutter, like, oh, if you have eczema, you're definitely going to have X, Y, and Z. So the thing that we want to look for is depending on what type of profile you have, like, is there the potential to have a parasitic infection? Is there possible fungal overgrowth? Are there potential opportunistic bacteria that shouldn't be there? Like the Pseudomonas species, um, Klebsiella species, um, are there, is there H. pylori present? Is there an overgrowth or is there an undergrowth? Um, you know, so we really want to do a 2000 foot view, so to speak, to understand what's happening in the GI tract. And then also to be fair, I want to say and give a shout out to the dentists that are really forward thinking here, because what goes on in our mouth is equally important because if you do not have sufficient stomach acid, you're swallowing all the bacteria that live in your mouth. And if you have, um, for example, root canals where there is dead tissue, you are swallowing all of those infections that are festering in your mouth, unfortunately. Um, that can also be, I think, the case with caps as well, that bacterial and fungal organisms can hide out under there. And so you can inadvertently be allowing access to your GI tract because low stomach acid is present. Um, it's one of the big things that I really look for in clients and um, you know, I think it's important to determine a, if you have low stomach acid and B, is it the result of H pylori? Because it's not, it's never just H pylori. It's never just SIBO. <laughs> it's never just those two things for anyone listening. It's usually something that's going on upstream as well as downstream. And you need to look at the full GI tract in order to figure out what's going on. But by addressing the imbalance internally, it actually helps to create more peace on the skin and reduces that internal inflammation because skin issues are not just an outside in. That's the mistake we make in looking at it from just like the conventional dermatology route. It's really outside in and inside out. And the only way to address that internal inflammation is by saying where else is inflammation being driven. And one of the big pieces is that, that gut microbiome. Mm, wonderful. And I know that a lot of people can deal with skin issues related to histamines. Is that fair to say? And what's going on there? So that you bring up a good point, actually. So the histamine picture is a little different than just a straight like, hey, I've got skin rashes. I don't know what's going on. A lot of people also too think because they have itchy skin, they have a histamine problem because their dermatologist or their doctor advised them to take Allegra or Zyrtec or something like that. So a histamine type picture means that you struggle with allergies. It could be seasonal, could be um, food allergies could be um, dander, environmental allergies. Um, usually there is some sort of crazy intense histamine type reaction. So you're becoming incredibly reactive to wine, alcohol, kombuchas, sauerkrauts, maybe even um, leftovers. Worst case is leftovers where you cannot tolerate leftover food anymore because it, foods actually increase in histamines the longer they sit after being cooked. Um, and you know, yes, there could certainly be itchiness, um, but histamine, a histamine picture is a little bit different. And so one thing that I look for is a, are there any potential, um, cross reactive food allergies going on? So where, for example, you're reactive to, I was saying about milk thistle. So say you have, um, a ragweed allergy a cross-reactive food allergy there would be stevia. And stevia is used in a lot of keto products, a lot of gluten-free products, a lot of protein powders. And so someone may actually be inadvertently increasing their histamine levels by consuming a food. It's similar to where oral, like oral allergy syndrome, where you maybe have, I think it's a birch allergy, but you, when you eat stone fruits, like cherries and peaches and such, it makes your mouth feel really funky and fuzzy, or maybe it starts to swell. So oral allergy syndrome is another red flag. Um, and then from there, I'm looking for histamine producers under the surface. I will say from a blood, blood lab perspective, an elevated total IgE and high eosinophils that show up on a CBC panel are red flags for a histamine problem. 
especially when the total IgE being elevated cannot be explained away. Like say, for example, you have a nut allergy, but you haven't consumed nuts in 10 years. Why is your total IgE still high? It doesn't make sense. And so there we want to look for what else could be driving that higher. That can be H. pylori because H. pylori destabilizes mast cells in the system. Uh, some parasites can also do that as well. And the other things to consider, are there certain bacteria in your GI tract? They shouldn't be there normally, but um, they do show up on certain stool tests. They are looked for on like the... Um, the more like comprehensive stool tests that you can usually purchase yourself or get through a practitioner, but Morganella species is one. It's a huge, huge histamine producer. And then also to just generally speaking, Klebsiella species, not Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is always like kind of one of those red flag triggers for Hashimoto's, but other Klebsiella species can be histamine producers. So what that means is essentially the reason your total IgE is elevated is that you have bugs in the GI tract that are basically handing you histamine all the time. You are a histamine production factory. And so your cup to be able to tolerate histamine on a daily basis is getting really full. So it doesn't take much to tip it over. It could just be that vinegar on your salad. It could just be that kombucha you're drinking every day at lunch. It could be the leftovers because you no longer, like if, when you can no longer tolerate leftovers, that is severe. That is pretty, pretty severe. Um, and so, oh, the other thing I should mention too, um, when you have, so we all have this one um, part of our immune system, they're called immunoglobulins, they're amazing. And so in our GI tract, actually throughout our mucosal membranes, there's a secretory IgA which is there, it's like your police force, it's your first line of defense, and it's there to really help um, catch things in the act before they cause a systemic problem. And when that level gets depressed, which is not uncommon to see in chronic skin issues, it actually will prioritize, that will cause IgE, our allergic histamine type response to become prioritized. And so that's where we want to work to support immunoglobulins. It's one reason why I love to use immunoglobulins in my practice with histamine cases, but also too, this can explain why you feel like you're becoming increasingly reactive to things and your histamine issues are getting worse is because your body is trying to protect you, but the way it's doing it actually is making things worse. So again, the gut is a huge piece. It's complicated, um, but it is absolutely connected. It's, it's a huge piece of the puzzle. I love how many pieces you touched on because I'm, I'm currently going through a suppressed IgA experience. We can't figure out why my IgA is so low and nothing is helping and it's not showing up in my skin, but I think a lot of people wait too long, mm -hmm. you know, before they start kind of investigating like what's going on here. I'm starting to have these symptoms. Like usually we wait until it's so far gone. And that's probably one, an issue with a traditional medicine that we wait until like, there's a huge fire until we deal with it. Um, but if somebody's listening, who's like, mm, you know, you mentioned some things that are a little bit concerning, what kind of labs are covered by insurance or perhaps not covered that they could um, investigate, like you mentioned uh, with histamine levels, the IgE and sonophils? Was there anything else that they could kind of look to their labs to kind of get the support and understanding what could be going on? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually think regular labs can be very helpful. They do not show um, the full picture. It's sort of like looking at a flat two-dimensional like photo. And then when you get functional labs to add in, it creates a three-dimensional picture. Is it a hundred percent like going to tell you the truth? No, that's where having somebody who has clinical experience can look at it and actually help you piece it together. But, um, I would say from a conventional standpoint, there is a CBC panel. So that includes the eosinophils. The total IgE is something different. Um, and so that's what you would have to ask your doctor or allergist to do. I love to see fasted comprehensive metabolic panels looking at both kidney and liver function. Um, I would say also like vitamin D, vitamin A are both equally important. Um, B12, homocysteine, 
folate is incredibly important. If you can get um, the red blood cell or erythrocyte zinc value, that can be helpful. The serum zinc, or if it's just a zinc, that's like not really helpful to be honest with you. Cause we want to know what's inside the red blood cell. That's how we know from a nutritional perspective, if you have sufficient storage, um, a urinalysis is helpful. If you can get homocysteine great. Cause it's a really great marker to know how much B6 you have in your system. But unless you are, if you have a car, you have to have a cardiac risk factor basically for that, or you have to be like in your sixties and older, a lot of times to get it, unless your doctor like gets it and will order it for you. Um, and I, I think those are kind of like off the top of my head, those are probably like the big ones that I would say, as far as looking what's going on in the GI tract, really, like I personally for the U S prefer the GI map. I think that's a great stool test to be able to get, um, in other countries, it varies. There's like the health path in Great Britain. That's really great. And you can order that yourself online. And then there's another one in Australia and New Zealand, which the name right this second is evading me. Um, but you do have options. So don't feel like you're out of options or that if your doctor, the stool test, if your doctor agrees to run a stool test and they do one through like Quest or LabCorp, you're pretty much not going to come back with anything unless you like have C. diff or you have some really severe infection, which most people do not have an overt problem. It's not going to come back with anything if they even agree to do it. And even if they did, they're going to be like, what's the connection? If you don't have any GI symptoms, they have no reason to write for a stool test. So a lot of times like a GI map is something you can get through a practitioner or you can order on your own, depending on what US state you live in. And, um, and you just start piecing things together. And I mean, I, man, it's just like, it's very rewarding to help someone finally have answers to their questions because you know, I know that sometimes doctors are really skeptical and it's funny. I work with a lot of nurses. I work with a lot of MDs, surprisingly, like they don't know how to like do this themselves. <laughs> They'll contact me. They're like, Hey, can you help me? I can order the labs. I just don't know what they mean from like a different standpoint. And it's really rewarding to help healthcare professionals actually with their health. Um, the one thing I will mention is if you go for the regular blood labs, make sure seven days beforehand to stop every supplement that you're taking that has biotin in it, or you have to alert the lab that you're taking biotin because biotin will actually mess up blood labs quite a bit and can cause false negatives and false positives and hot unnatural highs and lows. So just make sure that you look through all of your supplements, not food, just supplements. And if you're allowed to, if it's okay, stop them about seven days before to let your biotin level naturally drop. And, um, hopefully you won't have any issues with that. Yeah. I can attest to the lab corp versus GI map. I've had multiple clients come to me with it and say, look, look, I have no problems. I'm like, let's run a GI map. And it's like problems everywhere. So it really does make a difference. And one thing I've noticed with homocysteine, you're right. A lot of doctors will not pull it unless they're older. Um, one thing I've noticed actually works. I don't know if it's just a hand, it was just luck of the draw, but if you say that you have the MTHFR mutation, and you have like a genetic, like 23 and me that you can print off doctors will be more open to run the homocysteine, um, because homocysteine levels can be usually higher if you have the MTHFR mutation. So I found that's actually been helpful for a lot of my clients. So anyone listening, who's bashing their head against a wall, cause their doctor won't listen. That's something that I found to be helpful with most doctors that are told that. So just a tip. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's great when you can offer tips like that because any tips or tricks, and actually I didn't know that Leanne. So you just taught me something. Yay! This never happens. I'm going to take that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I never thought to do that before. So I will give that a shot. I've had pretty good luck. I usually write letters for clients. So most mm -hmm. of the time the doctor's willing to do it. Um, but yeah, B6 is really important, especially if your liver enzymes are wacky. So yeah, completely. And so, um, you mentioned this a little bit and I want to like circle back to it. Cause I wasn't yeah. sure we'd have time, um, was the elimination diet, just like why diets don't work a little bit of the food sensitivity stuff we touched on. Um, 
and maybe some favorite foods that, that you, that you have found can be helpful when somebody's struggling with this, like the food aspect. Yeah. I think it's important to clean up your diet. I don't want to sound like, you know, keep eating junk food, keep eating lots of sugar, keep eating all the things that, you know, you probably shouldn't. Um, but it, it doesn't matter as much as you think it does. And also to some degree, we should be able to tolerate like, I have a hard time when people are like, well, I can't tolerate plants. I'm like, or I can't tolerate, right. Or I can't tolerate meat. And I'm like, mm, I'm not saying everybody has to be a certain way. I think every person should have their own diet, but I'm like, if you can't tolerate something, something's going on and you should ask why, why is that? So my issue with elimination diets is that yes, for some people, they could accidentally stumble upon the right elimination diet. Like there's a psoriasis diet, there's an eczema diet. Um, there's also a rosacea diet as well. Um, there are diets that for some people can be helpful. The problem is that they don't hit at the root causes of issues. They're simply removing foods that you may have an issue with. So for example, with eczema, there's the, there's some people that believe or discover that they have a salicylate issue. So salicylates are a chemical that naturally occurs in many really healthy, amazing plants. Your body should be able for most people, it's not a problem, but some people do become quote unquote intolerant or sensitive to uh, salicylates. The reason isn't because your gut has a problem with it. It's because your liver detox does not have enough glycine and B6 to process the salicylates because that's actually where salicylic acid gets processed is in your liver, not in your GI tract. So there's this misunderstanding of number one, how our body handles certain chemicals and things in food, but then also to what's going on in terms of gut function. And so if you remove foods that you struggle with breaking down and they're being processed in an inappropriate fashion, they're going to cause issues. The result will cause issues for your skin or your gut or whatever else is going on. It happens to show up differently for different people. And so, for example, if you have that H. pylori we mentioned, well, H. pylori has an enzyme that deactivates your stomach acid. That's car accident number one in your digestive tract. There's no backup system for stomach acid. So everything else moving forward every time you eat, it's a car accident all the way down your GI tract. And you end up eventually actually at pooping expensive food <laughs> out the system because you don't absorb it. But you're also feeding gut bugs, proteins, which you shouldn't do. They're not supposed to ferment proteins. And so this is why I get it. Sometimes you're like, okay, I got on this elimination diet. My skin got better, but I can't reintroduce things. Or I've tried all the elimination diets. I've been in the Facebook groups. I've tried taking out eggs and all these other things and nothing is helping. You have to look deeper. If you can't eventually get off an elimination diet, something else is going on. And also, like I was saying, we don't make all the nutrients we need to thrive, right? We have to have them constantly coming in. But if you can't break them down, if you struggle with absorbing them, where do you think they come from? I mean, I'm asking a legitimate question for people. Like we take for granted the way our body operates. So much of it is this tremendously magical to some degree symphony that we don't still to this day fully understand. I would love to think that we completely understand how our body works. We don't. That's why we are constantly seeing new research studies and all sorts of things. There is a lot of things that we just do not understand that maybe to right this right to this day and age are still somewhat quote unquote magical because we don't understand how they work. We're like, we think we understand. We might have a guess, but we're not hundred percent sure. And in order for your body to operate optimally, it has to have everything that it needs to be able to make those processes happen. And so for a lot of my folks who have been on elimination diets, they end up very nutrient depleted. 
And yes, this can happen on carnivore. Um, and one of the biggest reasons that I found on carnivore is because some people like myself do not like liver. And if you cannot tolerate liver, I cannot tell you how many people I have found who did carnivore, who did not eat liver and who had a folate deficiency, which like is really weird and, and not normal. Like only people that have done carnivore, like even I've had people who are like, low end and normal, suboptimal folate, but never saw folate deficiencies until people who were doing carnivore who didn't eat liver. I don't like liver. I'm not a good candidate to ever give carnivore a try because I can't get access to those nutrients because I just don't like it. So you have to recognize that if you can't comply by the guidelines of certain diets and you're not also checking the levels of critical nutrients, you can become really nutrient deficient and it can cause serious problems systemically. So um, the same goes if you're down to five foods, 10 foods a day, that's not healthy. Our gut thrives, our body thrives on diversity. And you can actually cause yourself to become increasingly sensitive to foods the more you remove them. So if you do it for a couple of weeks, you do it for a month, you don't see any improvement, I would just highly encourage you, lovingly nudge you toward asking for help because you if you don't have any background in understanding the complexity of nutrition and digestion and absorption, I, I've worked with many people who eat the perfect diet. It's grass fed, pasture raised, organic, cooked at home, never eat out, don't eat any omega-6 inflammatory. It doesn't matter if you're not breaking it down and you're not absorbing it and your GI tract, unfortunately, especially your microbiome has turned into a bit of a mess. It's going to cause problems. And so um, that's why I would say, like, I don't want people to develop fears of food either. And there's a lot of orthorexia to almost outright eating disorders that are happening to people who go down this rabbit hole of wanting to fix their skin and don't realize that now they're afraid of food. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So good. Mic drop. Um, do you know my big fat Greek wedding and the family yes. constantly puts Windex, Windex on everything? Yeah. I feel like when you Google skin problems, the, the, the Windex to my big fat Greek wedding is coconut oil to skin problems. Like yes. it's like, Don't put coconut it. oil on it, Don't put coconut it. oil on it. Yeah. Thoughts? <laughs> no, no to the coconut oil specifically for eczema. It does make eczema worse. Psoriasis, some instances people will say it is, it actually helps. So I think you have to test that out with psoriasis, but generally speaking for most skin issues, no, it's too anti antimicrobial. It will throw off the balance of your skin. It's too, it won't be actually absorbed. It's too big of a molecule. So it doesn't allow your skin to actually breathe. So no. Um, and I'm also not a big fan. If you again have pretty, you have, you know, you have dysbiosis, you have to be careful also ingesting coconut oil, like massive amounts, because it can be converted by gram negative bacteria, like E. coli into lipopolysaccharides. And that can be inflammatory. So again, diet's important. Um, but we want to make sure that you look at your own specific picture, um, and follow what's going to work best for you. Brilliant. Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing everything with us. Where can people find more from you and just connect with you and maybe work with you and have you fix them? <laughs> I prefer to support them. <laughs> I don't make any guarantees. I don't, I don't never know what's going to happen on the road ahead, but um, I do my best. Uh, you can find me at skinterrupt.com. I also have a podcast called the healthy skin show, which is dedicated to all these topics. I've got over 200 episodes for you to dig through. So there's a ton of great content. And I'm also over on Instagram at Jennifer Fugo. So those are the best places to find me. So great. It was so awesome to see your face and reconnect. And um, I'm just so thankful for you coming on the show today. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. And likewise, it was wonderful to see you. And if there's anything else I can do to support your community, just let me know. 
Isn't Jennifer the best? Oh my goodness. It's been so long since I've gotten to see her and it's just been so nice uh, to see what she's doing in her clinical practice. And I'm just so incredibly excited for those of you who are struggling with skin issues that you have uh, a potential resource there for you. So I hope you really enjoyed today's show. Again, I will include all of Jennifer's information down there in the show notes. Just check it out. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments below. Okay, we will see you next Sunday for another episode of the Keto Diet Podcast. I hope you have a great rest of your week. Okay, bye.